Srila Prabhupada Ki Jai. So we are looking at this book, Easy Journey to Other Planets, and we are on chapter one. This is Srila Prabhupada's first book, even before coming to the US, before starting ISKCON. So uh, we've read the preface before, we heard about the introduction. Now let's look at chapter one itself. So this chapter is called Anti-Material Worlds, Anti-Material. So that means we understand as spiritual, but let's see at that time in the late 1950s, 1958, 59, 1960 even, Shri Prabhupada is writing all these articles which came out later as a small booklet which Shri Prabhupada used to distribute. So let's see what Shri Prabhupada has to say. Materialistic science may one day finally discover the eternal anti-material world, that means the eternal spiritual world, which has for so long been unknown to the wranglers of gross materialism. Wranglers means those who like to play around with, those who get stuck with gross materialism. So we can understand that this is the time where science is just taking a new frontier. Everything is being discovered. Everything new is being created. Technology, science, inventions. This was the era. Regarding the scientist's present conception of antimatter, so what is the scientist's understanding of antimatter? We understand it as spirit. The Times of India, October 27, 1959. So you can see where Prabhupada began this whole book in October 1959. Published the following news release. So this is the Times of India. Uh, Prabhupada already had taken Vanaprastha by the time 1955. He had left home, right, staying in Vrindavan, moving around here and there, trying to do his magazines. So this is all during that period. So this is Stockholm, October 26, 1959. Two American atomic scientists were awarded the 1959 Nobel Physics Prize today for the discovery of the antiproton. Okay, so for those of you who are not coming from much science background, in a Atom, right? There's protons, neutrons, electrons. So they kind of found out an anti-proton, something which turns the other way. Uh, protons and all are moving. So this is something which is opposite. Proton has a positive charge. This has a negative charge. It's not an electron. It's within the proton. This is something, you know, opposite to it. Proving that matter exists in two forms, as particles and as anti-particles. So these are the two personalities. They are the Italian-born Dr. Emilio Sergei, 69 years old, and Dr. Owen Chamberlain, born in San Francisco. So they are quite famous uh, for their work. This is Emilio Segre, right? Emilio Segre, and this is Dr. Owen Chamberlain, right? both recently, in just 2006, passed away, and he passed away in 89. Okay. <clears throat> so their work then contributed to a lot of medical treatment, especially treatment of cancer, where they used to inject people with some, you know, lasers and anti-proton. It's used in many places now as well. So according to one of the fundamental assumptions of this new theory, there may exist another world or an anti-world buildup of anti-matter. Because when they found that there is something opposite to matter, that itself gives them an idea that, oh, there must be a whole world which is just made up of this entire opposite matter. This anti-material world would consist of atomic and subatomic particles spinning in reverse orbits to those of the world we know. We see everything moving one way. That could be something creating which is moving the other way. Okay, This was what uh, scientists in 1950s, 1960s, they were amazed about. And they said that if these two worlds would clash, they would be, an annihilate, they would be annihilated in one blinding flash. One is going positive, one is going negative. If they combine, two opposite universes come together, boom, catastrophe. This is what scientists and science fiction movies we hear. Prabhupada summarizes, in this statement, the following pro propositions are put forward. Like a thesis, no Prabhupada says. One, first proposition. There is an anti-material atom or particle which is made up of anti-qualities of material atoms. Okay, fine. There's something opposite to matter. Second, there is another world beside this material world of which we have only limited experience. Two. Three, the anti-material and material worlds may clash at a certain period and may annihilate each other. So these are the three propositions. Now, Prabhupada's genius. Shri Prabhupada says, out of these three items listed above, we, the students of theistic science, right, the Vedic science, can fully agree with items one and two, which means there exists another world, right? And there, there, there's something opposite to matter. So there exists spirit and there exists a spiritual world. First point is there exists spirit. Second point is there exists a spiritual world. 
but we can agree with item three only within the limited scientific definition of antimatter. So if they stick to their definition that it's, you know, there is something opposite in going in reverse. And if something is the other way and this way and both of it clash, destroy, is it okay? If that is your definition, we can accept. But to think that the material world and the spiritual world would crash, that we cannot accept. So Prabhupada continues to say, the difficulty lies in the fact that the scientist's conception of antimatter, what is the scientist's definition of what they mean by antimatter? When we, like I said, when we say antimatter, we understand it to be spirit, spiritual world, God's realm. But their understanding extends only to another variety of material energy. So the scientists, when they find matter and they say there is something opposite to this matter, they also are still considering, considering it to be matter. They're not considering it to be spirit. So the, the scientist's definition of antimatter is just another kind of matter. And therefore they say matter going in forward and matter going in reverse. If both collide, boom. So that's why they say like that. Of course, we understand that there is no opposite of matter is not matter. Opposite of matter is spirit. So again, all of this may sound very simple to us. Uh, it sounds very convincing. But someone who comes from hardcore, scientific, hardcore, logician background, right? someone who grew up with all this physics and theories, they would find this very fascinating. And Srila Prabhupada wanted to preach to the intellectuals. Whereas the real antimatter must be entirely antimaterial. Prabhupada says, actually, real antimatter means it should not even be matter. Matter as is constituted is subjected to annihilation. But antimatter, if it is to be free from all material symptoms, real definition of antimatter, must be also free from annihilation by its very nature. The proper is taking the fundamental definition. Matter means that which can be destroyed. Therefore, antimatter means that which is always lasting, cannot be destroyed. If matter is destructible or separable, then antimatter must be destructible and inseparable. Just the opposite. Matter can be destroyed, matter can be removed, can be separated. But that means antimatter cannot be destroyed and cannot be separated. Right. So we shall try to discuss the prepositions from an angle of authentic scriptural vision. Now, Prabhupada says these are what they have proposed. We will try to understand it based on Shastra. So then Prabhupada now starts. The most widely recognized scriptures in the world are the Vedas. The Vedas have been divided into four parts. So Prabhupada is already preparing that if I meet someone new, someone in the West, some scientific person who is going to like this uh, easy journey to other planets, let's start step to step. So Prabhupada says the most widely recognized scripture in the world is the Vedas. The Prabhupada's boldness. The Vedas are divided into four. Sama, Yajur, Rik and Atharva. The subject matter of the Vedas is very difficult for a man of ordinary understanding. Simple person cannot understand this. For elucidation, to explain, the four Vedas are explained in the historical epic called the Mahabharata and in the 18 Puranas. Just to describe the, the science of the Vedas, it is given in a story form in terms of Mahabharata, Ramayana and also in other story forms like the Puranas. The Ramayana is also a historical epic which contains all the necessary information from the Vedas. So Vedas in practice, Vedas in motion, Vedas animated are the Itihasas which means Mahabharata and Ramayana as well as the Puranas. Right? That Tattva, that knowledge when animated into like a Lively or a Cartoon. Nowadays people like animation, cartoon, right? And we, those days people used to read books story books and action books and mystery books and adventure books but now no one wants to read them so they convert books into uh, movies right so similarly the vedas turned into action or living movement is the mahabharata and ramayana and puranas and so on and so forth so one can still get the essence of it so the four vedas the original ramayana by valmiki the mahabharata and the puranas are classified as vedic literature the Upanishads are part of the four Vedas and the Vedanta Sutras represent the cream of the Vedas. Right? To summarize all this Vedic literature, the Bhagavad Gita is accepted as the essence of all Upanishads. Okay, So it's mentioned Sarvagavo Upanishadi. Just like if Upanishads are all uh, like uh, Upanishad is like the cow right? and then Bhagavad Gita is like the extraction. The Bhagavad Gita is like the 
the nectar which comes out from that, uh, with the milk from that cow. And the preliminary explanation of the Vedanta Sutra. So Bhagavad, having mentioned all the four Shastras, the Vedas and all the Vedangas, the limbs of the Vedas, Prabhupada comes down to Bhagavad Gita, which is the essence of the Vedas. Sarva Vedanta Sarambhi. One may then conclude that from the Bhagavad Gita alone, one can have the essence of the Vedas. For it is spoken by Lord Shri Krishna, the Supreme Personality of Godhead, who descends to this material world from the anti-material world. So now proper relates with what the topic of discussion is. That Supreme Lord Krishna has come down to speak Bhagavad Gita right, from the anti-material world. The anti-material world in order to give complete information of the superior form of energy. What a beautiful Prabhupada just brought it down that at least take shelter of Bhagavad Gita. Okay. The superior form of energy of the Supreme Personality of Godhead is described in Bhagavad Gita as para prakriti. Para means superior. The scientists have recently discovered that there are two forms of perishable matter. So, you see, scientists have found that there are two things, proton and antiproton. But the Bhagavad Gita describes most perfectly the concept of matter and antimatter in terms of two forms of energy. Okay, so what is this? These two things that Bhagavad Gita also described matter and antimatter, matter and spirit. This is basically found in uh, this verse, Bhagavad Gita 7.4 and 7.5, the next verse. So let's look at it. So here 7.4, Krishna speaks about the matter or the material energy. Bhumi, apo, nalo, vayu, kham, mano, buddhir, evacha, ahankara, me bhinna, prakritir, ashrada. These are eight energies, material energies of the Lord. Earth, water, fire, air, ether, mind, intelligence and false ego. Having said this in the next verse, 7.5, Krishna says, Aparayam, apara, better than this, higher than this, right? Aparayam, oh, sorry, inferior to this. These are all inferior. Aparayam, itastu anyam. These are all inferior. Anyaha, there's something better than this. There's something para. What is that? Prakritim vidime param jiva bhuta mahabahu. The living entity, they are superior to the matter. Right? The living entity is superior to matter. Matter is an energy which creates the material world and that same energy in its superior form also creates the anti-material world, transcendental world. Right? The matter in an inferior sense creates the inferior world and that energy in a superior form, spiritual form, creates the spiritual world. So it's all the Lord's energies. The living entities belong to the category of the superior energy. The inferior energy or material energy is called apara prakriti, aparayam itastu anyam. In the Bhagavad Gita, the creative energy is thus presented in two forms, namely apara, which we saw, bhumi apo nalo vayu, this is 7.4 Bhagavad Gita, and para prakriti, which is the jivas, right, and the spiritual world. This is 7.5. Now, matter itself has no creative power. If you just take fire, earth, on its own, it has no creative power. When it is manipulated by the living energy, when the para manipulates the apara, then something happens. Right? Then material things are produced. Matter in its crude form is therefore the latent energy of the supreme being. Right? It is the energy, but latent energy, not active energy. Whenever we think of energy, it is natural that we think of the source of energy. So now we are talking about para and apara, energies, energies, energies. But what's the source of it? For example, when we think of electrical energy, we simultaneously think of the powerhouse where it's generated. Energy is not self-sufficient. It is under the control of a superior living being. For example, fire is the source of two other energies, light and heat. When we think of light and heat, we think of fire. Fire is the origin of it. Light and heat have no independence, existence outside of fire. Similarly, the inferior and superior energies are derived from a source which one may call by any name. So Prabhupada doesn't want a name here. You may call him, uh, whatever you may call him, God. You know? A rose by any name smells the same. So we are looking at practicality, not naming at this moment. That source of energy must be a living being. Prabhupada says that that source, who is the origin of anything, some people like to call him Brahman, must be a living conscious personality with full sense of everything. That supreme living being is the personality of Godhead, Sri Krishna, or the all-attractive living being. So very nice here, Prabhupada says that matter is a latent energy, 
on its own, it cannot function. Just like if you take some metal and you just leave it there. It's not that after time, the metal will slowly come together and it will form into a phone or it will form into a bottle. Not like that. But when you have just pieces of metal and you put a living entity, a para prakriti, right? Para prakriti, para energy. And then the living entity starts to think and it starts melting the metal and doing something and then it can form something, right? So matter alone is inactive, latent, right? Matter alone does not function. But when the supreme being comes in, then he can actually manipulate matter. Just like around us, all of us, the table, the chair that we are sitting on, the computers, the laptops, the mobile phones, the wires, the gizmos, the whatnot, clothes that we use, these are all manipulated from matter, dead matter. But who can manipulate it? Only the intelligent living entity. You don't see one glass interacting with the bottle and they decide, let's make a, let's make a plate. You know, it's not like that, isn't it? You need a superior intelligence. That is the Jivatma. But Jivatma is also energy of the law. So matter is energy, Jiva is energy. Then who is the origin? That is the Supreme Personal Body. Like that. In the Vedas, the Supreme Living Being or the Absolute Truth is called Bhagavan. So Prabhupada gives the definition now. That Supreme Original, origin of all energies is called Bhagavan. The opulent one. The living being who is the fountainhead of all energies. The discovery of the two forms of limited energies by the modern scientists, right? what we saw as the proton and antiproton, is just the beginning of the progress of science. Now, they must go further to discover the source of the two particles of atoms by which they term material and anti-material. They found what is moving in this world, how things work. But where does it come from? Who is giving the brains to it? Who has designed Clockwise rotation, anti-clockwise rotation, rotation at an angle. Who has, who has given that? Where has that come about? How can the anti-material particle be explained? We have experience with material particles of atoms, but we have no experience with anti-material atoms. Right? We have experience with matter, hard table, hard chair, hard wall. But what is anti-matter? How does it look? How does it feel? So Bhagavad Gita gives us the following vivid description of the anti-material particle. Right? What is spirit? So here it says, this anti-material particle is within the material body. Spirit soul is within the material body. Because of the presence of this anti-material particle, the material body is progressively changing from childhood to boyhood, from boyhood to youth to old age. Because the living being, so this is, uh, uh, what is this? <clears throat> this is a verse in Bhagavad Gita, right? Dehino smin yata dehe, right? To, uh, 2.13, second chapter 13 verse. So here Prabhupada is explaining that because the soul is within this dead body matter, that's why this matter is growing from youth to old age. You know, we can experience this. Let's say if a child dies, passes away, and the child's body is there, and you say, wait, 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 keep it for a couple of years, it's going to grow because all child body grows. Keep it for some years. In the absence of a spirit soul, the body will not grow. Right? Someone dies young, 20 years old, 25 years old. It's not like, oh, wait, wait, keep it. It'll become old man. It will not. Right? The moment the spirit soul is absent from the body, the body does not function because the spirit soul is the one who is manipulating this body. So therefore, the anti-material particle is that which is residing within this body and the anti-material particle, that spirit soul, is that which is manipulating this body, making it change from childhood, kaumaram, to boyhood, yauvanam, to old age, jara, after which the anti-material particle leaves the old, unworkable body, useless body, has worn out and takes up another material body. Taktva dehantra praptim. Right? It gives up this body and takes another body. So this is the translation of 2.13, Robert's quoting. This description of a living body confirms the scientific discovery that energy exists in two forms. We also agree. Energy exists in two forms. A para shakti the jivatma and apara shakti, the matter. So the para is exploiting the apara. This body is a combination of two energies. What you're seeing here is the material energy. But what is moving it, driving it, growing it, aging it? That is the superior energy. So it's so simple to see that anything living, moving is a combination of two energies. If I show you this glass, how many energies is there in this? One energy. It's only apara. Shakti, because you're not going to see this glass grow, right? I hope if it increases in size someday, but no, it will not. 
isn't it? And if you see a creature, tree, an ant, an animal, you know there's two shaktis inside, two energies inside. It's very nice how Prabhupada is presenting this very complicated scientific idea. In when one of them, the anti-material particle, is separated from the material body, right? When one of these energies is separated from the material body, the later the latter becomes useless for all purposes. If the jiva is removed, like we said, it's the body becomes useless. As such, the anti-material particle is undoubtedly superior to the material energy. Therefore, we see that the presence of the jiva within matter is what animates matter. Therefore, the jiva, the para shakti, is superior. No one, therefore, should lament for the loss of material energy. This is also again Bhagavad Gita, where Arjuna, Krishna is advising Arjuna that do not, do not uh, cry, do not lament. You know that uh, if this body is lost. All varieties of sense perception in the categories of heat and cold, happiness and distress are but interactions of the material energy. This is a continuation of the second uh, chapter of Bhagavad Gita, 14th verse. Matras parshas to kauntiya shitosh ushna sukha dukada agama apaino nityastam stitikshaswa bharata which come and go like seasonal change. So all the sense perception that we experience is just coming and going. Just like when you drive a car. Right? You want to head to destination, let's say Highway 159. And to reach Highway 159, exit number 159, you pass by exit 120, exit 121. They keep coming, going, coming, going. For you, there's no difference because you are focused on that exit. Similarly, problems come, changes come, heat, cold, happiness, distress. They all keep coming, coming and going. They're just like the passing of those highways, but you know where your exit is. The temporary appearance and disappearance of such material in interactions confirms that the material body is formed of a material energy inferior to the living force or jiva energy. Right? This body is just made by matter. Then Prabhupada says, any intelligent man who is not disturbed by happiness and distress, understanding that there are different material phases resulting from the interactions of inferior energy, is competent to regain the anti-material world. So a person is, who understands this, that, you know, I have nothing to do with all this. Ultimately, it's just a show going on. I'm just driving my vehicle. Things keep coming, keep going. But ultimately, I'm not this body. I am that spirit soul. Such a person can gain the anti-material world. Such a person can go paramam gatim, can get the supreme law. Where life is eternal, full of permanent knowledge and bliss. So like that, the whole thread of the second chapter, uh, this Text 13 onwards, Prabhupada is quoting. The anti-material world is mentioned here and in addition, information is given that in the anti-material world, there is no seasonal fluctuation. It's not like suddenly, you know, you'll be forced by this, forced by that. Everything there is permanent, blissful and full of knowledge. But when we speak of it as a world, we must remember that it has forms and paraphernalia of various categories beyond our material experiences. So someone may say that matter has a form. That means anti-matter has no form. No. Matter has a form. Anti-matter has anti-matter form. Okay. If this is made out of uh, parashakti, right? If, sorry. If this is made out of aparashakti, then that anti-matter world is made out of parashakti. Simple. So, Prabhupada again quotes Bhagavad Gita. The material body is destructible and as such it is changeable and temporary. So is the material world. Right? This material body is destroyed, changing. So the material world around us is also constantly changing. It's dynamic. It's at a flux, fluctuation. But the anti-material living force is non-destructible. But inside who we are, the soul, that cannot be destroyed. Therefore, it is permanent. Expert scientists have thus distinguished the different qualities of the material and anti-material particles as temporary and permanent respectfully. This is also the translation of Bhagavad Gita. The proper kind of changed the language to make it more scientific. Right? So expert scientists means the great scholars, they, the rishis, you know, they have understood that you should see what is sat and asat. You should see what is temporary and you should see what is permanent. You should see these two energies within everything. Like I said, if I show you a remote, then you know there's only one energy. Right? There's only the material energy. But if you see a living being, a human, an animal, a dog, a cat, a tree, even an ant, one understands that there are two energies within it. 
the discovery of these two forms of matter have yet to find out the qualities of antimatter. The Prabhupada says that the scientist has found proton moving this way and antiproton moving that way. But actually, they have not really found out antimatter. But a vivid description is already given in Bhagavad Gita as follows. The scientists can make further research on the basis of this invaluable information. Prabhupada is you know, recommending that scientists, you read Bhagavad Gita and understand what real antimatter is. So here's again Bhagavad Gita. The anti-material particle is finer than the finest of material particles. The living force is so powerful that it spreads its influence all over the body. The anti-material particle has immense potency in comparison to the material particle and it's constantly, it cannot be destroyed. Right? So some qualities. These are all qualities of soul that I mentioned from uh, text 2.20 onwards. But Robert continues, this is but the beginning of the description of antimaterial particle in the Bhagavad Gita and then it's further explained as follows. So we would like to stop here. It's a long chapter. We'll take it bits and parts and we'll try to look again at all the quotations also. So we'll continue again reading about these two energies next time. Hare Krishna. Shila Prabhupada Ki Jai.